Uh, welcome to Aisha's journey on this December 1st, 2020. The time is 7.42 p.m. And believe it or not, this is my third take for trying to record because I keep getting messed up and trying to read this story to you. Well, I am reading to you and it's not going to be from the war so new. I'm, I'm actually choosing something with a different written format. It is a hood story. It's called One for Life, and I'm not going to tell you what it's about just yet. I'm just going to read it, and if you listen, you'll get the gist of it. If not, I'm not going to spoil it for those who are interested. But anyway, I'm just going to jump right into it, all right? All right. Chapter 1. I sat on the front porch of a three-family house on Waterfield Avenue in Stanford, Connecticut. I looked to my right at the corner, the intersection of Waterfield and Stillwater, waiting for my boyfriend, Waldo. I kicked at some of the charred wood that had fell from the third floor window pane after last week's storm. Two years ago, a kitchen fire had left the third floor uninhabitable, and the landlord didn't have the money to fix it. And so, there it sat, like a secret clubhouse for kids, boarded up, the black eye of Waterfield Avenue. I was happy, though, happier than the cotton candy to be going to the movies to see Transformers 4. It had just came out last night, and I was really going to the movies to see it and not watching it on bootleg. Waldo and I had been getting along really well for a couple of weeks now. We hadn't argued or anything. Nothing. I twirled the loose string on my jean shorts I bought from Rainbow in Norwalk last summer. They were the only pair of jean shorts I had left. The other two had just fell apart from cheap stitching and my irresponsibility of washing them too aggressively at the laundromat. I had 30 bucks to my name after working a week for labor ready down near the train station in South Norwalk. That was my 9 to 5 without mandatory rules. There was no attendance requirements unless a job was given that required more than one day's work. I mean it. It really was a convenience. Work today, get paid today. It was a rather easy week. I spent 40 hours in Fairfield helping to set up a bed, bath, and beyond. I've done everything for Labor Ready, from vehicle transportation to furniture removal, which was quite backbreaking. After helping Waldo pay the rent and my cell phone bill, 30 bucks seemed like a thousand. No matter how hard I worked for my money, I always had to fork it over to Waldo. He always needed it for something. But that's water under the bridge now, because I'm about to be on a date. (laughs) <laughs> the movie was set to start at 7.30. It was already after 6.30. Walder was supposed to be back early because we were supposed to go smoke before we saw the movie. He didn't pick up his phone when I called and he didn't respond to my text messages. Yeah, I heard from the first floor window. Mr. Rodriguez was a retired custodian from the Dominican Republic. He had type 2 diabetes and drank like a fish. Yes, I answered him. I got up from the step and walked over to the window. I need you to go to the store for me. Are you busy? He asked, peeking from behind his glasses. I bit my lip in frustration. I didn't mind going to the store for Mr. Rodriguez because he always was grateful and he let me keep the change. But at the same time, I was waiting for Waldo. I'm kind of waiting for Waldo, I answered. But I'll go if you look out for me. Just tell him where I am if he shows up before I get back. Mr. Rodriguez pulled a 10 out of his front shirt pocket. Listen, I need a stick of butter and a small box of rice. Then he creeped in and whispered, and a can of beer. Mr. Rodriguez, your sugar, I can't do that. I whined, a little concerned. He waved his hand at me, ah, hush. It's just one can of beer. That's okay, you know. It's terrible, this disease. I can't do anything I want to do. I thought for a few seconds, then I agreed to go. Mr. Rodriguez smiled and walked out onto the porch, seemingly taking my place. Two houses up on the same side of the street, Tamika and Scott was arguing. It looked like over a parking space. Tamika had their two-year-old son, Travis, in her arms. The little boy in tears as his mother and father argued over something that was far from the root of the problem. Tamika, I called from the fence. Let me take Travis to the store with me. What? Hmm. Here. I opened the fence and ran the five or six steps and took Travis out of her arms. He looked at me and smiled. That little boy had my heart and he knew it. His tiny honey brown fingers grabbed onto me as he laughed. Travis, how are you? I asked, very politely. His eyes opened wide and he stuck his hand in his mouth, still smiling. You're such a sweet little man. Yes, you are. Are you so handsome? He finally burst in laughter, leaning backwards, flailing his arms. When, he got to, when we got to Julio's bodega on the corner of Stillwater and Waterfield, I bumped into Scratch. 
one of Waldo's uh, associates. He grabbed up my eyes so hard, I thought he would yank them out of the socket. Waldo and Scratch flipped together sometimes, but Scratch was psychotic. He was lawyer, but he was crazy as bat. You know what I mean? Sugar, honey, I see. I switched Travis over to my left hip and tried to scoot past him. He blocked the door in front of Julio's and smiled at me. Excuse me, I said firmly. Good. I was waiting on you to bring, my, to bring our son. It was funny as hell, but scary as too. What? Excuse me. Come on, Scratch, stop playing. When he finally did move, he brushed his hand over the top of my behind, and I squeaked. Nah, Scratch, don't do that, I said, pulling Travis closer to me. Whatever, he responded. He adjusted his crotch with his right hand, then wandered off. I grabbed a box of rice, a stick of butter, and a tall can of Colt 45 out of the refrigerator, and a box of animal crackers for Travis. I opened a box of crackers for him and let him eat one. We waved goodbye to Julio, then headed back down Waterfield. Tamika and Scott were gone, but their front door was wide open. Obviously, they were in the house, so I took Travis with me back to my house and sat down on the steps after I gave Mr. Rodriguez the stuff. Did you see Waldo? I asked as I handed him the items. Not a uh, gracia, gracia, he answered as he took his things and went back inside. I sat with Travis for about a half hour before Tamika came back outside. We had all but devoured two of the cookies in the box. She ran over to me. Oh, thank you for taking them, she said, as he reached out for his mother, mouth still full of animal crackers. No problem, I answered. I watched him walk back to the house, Tamika kissing him on the forehead. They went up the steps and into the house, and just like that, I was alone again. It was now after seven, and Waldo still hadn't showed up. The two mosquito bites I had on my leg increased from two to seven. I now had three on my arms and two on my face, all swollen to the size of lemon heads. I didn't want to scratch them, and I tried not to, but every couple of minutes I found myself touching them again. I called Waldo's phone again. Nothing. I texted him two more times, and he still didn't text me back. (sighs) 7.30 came and went, and still no Waldo. I wanted to scream, though. I was in a good place. I thought we was in a good place. And then it starts again. The games and the BS. At first, I stopped myself, thinking something awful had happened. Then I stopped again and realized that something awful did happen and that my stupid ASS was at the punchline of it. He was probably with some other girl, some stupid chicken head getting his stuff sucked while I'm waiting on the front porch for him. How effing stupid am I? I got tired of looking through my phone and I just stood up. It was now after eight. It was dark out and the mosquito population had multiplied. I watched cars pass, not once seeing Waldo's black impala. I was hungry and my excitement about Transformers 4 was dwindling. I began pacing, thinking to myself all kinds of stuff. Where would I be if I finished school? Where would I be if I had just left Waldo 13 years ago after the first time he hit me? I remember when I met him. It was 13 years ago. I was 22 and on my way home from work from the post office, I had attempted to hire a position there as a mail clerk in the distribution center at the end of West Avenue, where all the city's mail is redistributed. He was eating pizza and walking with somebody. When I passed him, he stopped, and I, but I just kept walking. A few minutes of walking, I realized that he was following me. I kept walking, and he kept pursuit. He followed me for two miles, all the way to my mom's house on Miami Lane. When I finally turned and acknowledged him, he had his hands on his knees, breathing real heavily. I smiled and wrote my number on a piece of paper. I should have just kept going. Why did I stop? I had enough of the mosquito, the mosquitoes draining me. I took my $10 out of my back pocket. It was supposed to be for soda and popcorn. My throat clenched when I thought about the last time Waldo and I went to the movies. It was three years ago, and Think Like a Man had just came out. If any movie to see, it, I just had to see that one, I guess. Waldo and I had just got back together. We had broken up after serious life-threatening disrespect had occurred. I contracted an STD. It could have only been from Waldo. And when I talked to him about it, he blew his top and blamed me. Called me all kinds of bees and, and hoes, everything but the child of God. After I visited the doctor, I moved out of his house and stayed with a friend from the neighborhood named Little Dot. Me and Little Dot were friends first. I knew she got around. And me, for the life of me, didn't see her eye in my Waldo. Not till it was too late. He stalked me the whole time we was apart. 
I know it truly seems like Walder was so obsessed with me, but the truth of the matter was that he knew he was wrong, and I was hanging around a girl that had plenty of dudes hanging around her all the time. When I gave in, like I usually do, I wouldn't have sex with Walder without a condom. He was pissed at first, then he played along, laughing, like it was all a joke and I had gotten over on him. What's worse was I thought I had the upper hand, like this time everything was going my way, and he would have to accept that. Anyway, we went to the movie and we sat in the back by ourselves all hugged up on one another. Everything was grown and sexy and then something happened. A scene, a couple of the actors were half naked showing their bodies and a few of the women in the movie were catcalling. And I got excited. I didn't see any harm in it so I did it too. Walter had put his hand over my mouth and I pushed his hand off. I looked him in the face and asked, yo, what the F is you doing? Dang, Walter, are you jealous? I sat back and away from him. Not even a second later, his fist knocked the hell out of me. My head hit the wall next to me, and I hollered in pain. Waldo grabbed my neck and shoved me really hard. Tears were falling down my face. He began threatening me, right in my ear. You a smart B, ain't you? What the F so funny, huh? B-I-T-C-H. You think them niggas is cute? I'll kill you, you B-I-T-C-H. I'll F and end you. Try that sh again. Try it. He pulled his hand off of my mouth, then he reached down and pulled his out of his pants. He reached behind my hand and shoved my face toward his crotch. And just for being such a whore, you get to be one for the rest of the movie. Try me, you be. Try me. Not only was I in extreme pain, but for the next 40 minutes, I had to literally, you know what I mean? I was humiliated. So freaking stupid to ask for help. I let him do that to me. What's worse is that two days later, I forgave him and laughed as if it was okay. I stepped down off the porch and walked to Julio's to buy some green alcohol for the mosquito bites. I had no use for it now. I knew we weren't going to the movies. Other instances of Waldo's abuse flashed across my mind. Seven years ago, Waldo had borrowed over a grand of some drug money he owed to a supplier to buy his Impala. When the dealer didn't accept his excuses on what happened to the money, I found myself at the losing end of a sex train ran on me by the supplier and his brother, all while he watched in tears. I cried harder than I had ever cried. It was the first time Waldo had threatened to commit suicide in front of me. He had put his gun to his head and pulled the trigger, and every time I reached for it, he pushed me off and do it again. It was the first time I heard him cry out to God, and it broke me. I was his after that, and the disrespect and humiliation that came with loving him beat on me every day. But he had me too deep, and I just couldn't see myself free. I stopped at the corner in front of Julio's, almost in a trance. It was a warm, humid night. I could see the fireflies bulbing up and down the street. The two and three family houses sat next to each other like columns. I walked in and headed for the stationary aisle. I grabbed the smallest bottle of green alcohol, a 99-cent Arizona tea, and a dollar fifty bag of Lay's potato chips. With the six bucks I had left, I bought a black and mild for a dollar. As Julio slid me to five, he saw me eyeing the scratch-off. The usual, Ia, he asked. I hesitated. I didn't want to spend my last five on a win for life that, that I usually bought. Almost every time I came to a store, I shrugged my head and answered, What the hell? Why not? Who knows, you know? Oh, excuse me. Ooh. Julio pulled back the five and tore off the five dollar win for life, then handed it to me. I must have spent over $1,000 over the years buying those freaking scratch-offs and only won about $200 back. I slid the scratch-off into my back pocket and thought, nothing, and, and thought no more of it. I stood at the door for about five minutes, watching a soccer game between Brazil and Portugal. I had forgotten all about Waldo that fast. When I realized it, I bolted out the door and headed back toward the house. But it was too late. Waldo was standing in front of his Impala. The front end was smashed in, and he was arguing with somebody on the phone. What the hell happened, I asked him as I walked toward the car. Waldo had on his blue cargo shorts and a pair of blue and white high-top Nikes, the Air Force ones. He wore a white t-shirt with a blue stripe down the side. His hair was braided, thanks to me, and about ten cornrows down his back. For some crazy reason, I thought about Travis. I really wanted to have kids with Waldo. I just couldn't get pregnant, no matter how much we tried. When he turned and saw me, he blew up. And where the F you been at? His nose was flared and he was... I guess showing his teeth like a mad